Aloha, and welcome to Aquarian Radio at AquarianRadio.com. I'm your host, Janet Karolesa. I am the CEO of the Aquarian Radio Network, and I'm here along with my co-host, anthropologist Sasha Alex Lesson, Ph.D., and today's show is an episode of Enki Speaks, and it's entitled Alalu, First Homo Sapien on Earth from Nibiru. 500,000 years ago, Nibiru's protective shield weakened. The thick atmosphere of Nibiru thinned, and this made the Nibirans go for gold, ultimately, uh, on Earth, which they were going to powder into Nibiru's air. That would save their atmosphere and keep the heat they needed. So what uh, the scientists said in Nibiru, Nibiru's air has thinner been made. The protective shield diminished. To Lama, Nibiru's king, Enki, uh, wrote that he said, In the councils of the learned, to heal the breach in the atmosphere were two suggestions. Use gold within the hammered belt, abundant. To finest powder, Gold could be ground, lofted high to heaven, suspended it could remain. With replenishment, the breach it would heal. Let celestial boats to the gold to Nibiru bring over. Let ter- weapons of terror, which could have been nukes, be created. The missiles, the volcanoes, to attack. Their dormancy to bestir. Their belching to increase. The atmosphere to replenish. The breach to make disappear. So the hammered belt uh, refers to the asteroids. Um, they knew there was gold there. Celestial boats was the word they used for rockets. So uh, Enki goes on in his lost book that uh, Zechariah Sitchin translated, quote, For a decision, Lama, the king, was too feeble. What The choice, he knew not which to make. Now every 3,600 years in those days, Nibiru, as it circled Nemesis, another uh, red dwarf star, and crossed through Solaris's ecliptic, that's our sun's uh, path, lost more and more oxygen. In, in other words, Nibiru just kept losing its oxygen every time it went around. For four orbits, King Lama vacillated. Should he nuke the volcanoes or should he send miners to the ast- asteroids? And while he pondered, Nibiru's air bled into space. Intense radiation afflicted the planet. But Lama ignored his counselors, and instead he heeded what his wife said. His wife's name was Lamaha. She told him, Beseech the creator of all. Beseeching, not acting, provides the only hope. Prince Alalu descended from Nibiru's fourth king, Antragal, who was a concubine, led his fellow princes. Let Lama the king be no more, he roared. Let decision supplant hesitation. Come, let us unnerve the king in his dwelling. Let him the throne abandon. The princess rushed the palace gate, then the throne room. Lama retreated to his tower, where Alalu caught him. We need a king who acts now, not you, you dither. I'm taking over now, before we lose all our air. Alalu hurled the king from the tower, and he declared, now I'm king. Yeah, um... Anchugal uh, was the king, and uh, the, uh, the f- he was uh, with a concubine. That was the uh, uh, mother of Alalu, and so we, we read it wrong when we said uh, uh, that Anchugal was a concubine. <laughs> he was actually the king. So anyway, Alalu gave his daughter, Damkina, to Ia, um, who becomes Enki, it was his name, to the son of Anu, uh, so that they would have a deal. Anu said, hey, Alalu, you know, I'm supposed to be the king, not, not you. Now, I came from the, the, the original king's youngest son, Inuru, and I contest your claim. I'm the legal pretender, and me, not you, Alalu, should be the ruler, the king of Nibiru. But Alalu told Anu, look, let's wed our children, my daughter Damkina 
your son Enki, I'll rule and will forestall civil war. My cup bearer shall you be, always near consulting me, said Alalu. Anna agreed, and he canceled the betrothal of his daughter Nima uh, with Enki, Nibiru's, who was Nibiru's greatest scientist. Instead of Nima, Enki was to wed Damkina, and Nima pined for Enki, but sought solace in sex with Anu's heir, uh, which was her her half brother Enlil, who was also the half brother of Enki, and Enlil was a dashing military man, and Enlil, who before the Anu Alalu marriage deal would have followed Anu as Nibiru's king lost the position as Anu's successor to a son Enlil's brother Enki would make with Alalu's daughter. So um, Alalu and Alalu's daughter Damkina and Enki would produce the heir to the throne. The first male born that they would birth would rule Nibiru, and that was the agreement between Anu and Alalu. And they, they said, quote, one line or two shall become. This was a quote by Alalu. Enki and Damkina had a boy Marduk. When Marduk ruled Nibiru, genes of grandfathers Alalu and Anu would both empower him. And this pact will in millennia to come fuel the wars on earth. With the deal in place, Anu pledged fealty to Alalu. Alalu, who was now king, made Anu his cutbearer. King Alalu didn't, though he really tried. He did not succeed in saving Nibiru's heir. To raise the overcast that was going to hold in Nibiru's heir, he had rockets drop the nuclear bombs in the volcanoes of Nibiru, but this didn't work. It didn't touch off the eruptions, and the hole in the atmosphere kept getting worse and bigger and bigger. Then Alalu explored the gold dust shield option. Earth and its asteroids hold most of the golden solar system, so he sent a rocket there. The rocket crashed into an asteroid, though. Everybody on there died. For nine more Nibiran circles around uh, the sun, this 32,400 Earth years, uh, Alalu still hadn't stopped the loss of Nibiru's heir. Anu, who was now Alalu's cupbearer, Seed when Alalu fared to protect and replenish Nibiru's atmosphere. So Anu rebelled against Alalu. Anu cited the Nibiru law and proclaimed himself the rightful king, and he challenged Alalu. Quote, to hand-to-hand -hand combat with naked bodies, Alalu he challenged. Alalu in combat was defeated by a claim Anu was hailed as king. Anu to the palace was escorted. Alalu to the palace did not return. From the crowds, he stealthily escaped. Of dying like Lama, he was fearful. Unbeknownst to others, to the place of the celestial chariots, where the rockets were, he hurriedly went. Into a missile-throwing chariot, Alalu climbed. Its hatch behind him he closed. The four-part chamber he entered the commander's seat he occupied. In the celestial boat, Alalu from Nibiru escaped. To snow-hued earth, Alalu set his course. Alalu nuked the asteroids en route to earth, and 440,000 years ago, he landed on a marshy area, sort of land, sort of swamp, near Basra on the Persian Gulf, and he waded ashore. Now, most of the land that Alalu explored is now under the water of the Persian Gulf, Two of the rivers he found, Tigris and Euphrates, still flow through Iraq. But 450,000 years ago, when Alalu first got to Basra, the Tigris and Euphrates were joined by the Gehan River, which ran through Iran and joined the Euphrates. So Alalu, when he landed, he puts, he puts on his oxygen mask, he puts on his wetsuit, he wades ashore, and then he realizes his testers say it's safe, and he takes his helmet off. He can breathe on Earth. He extends the uh, tester and sees that it's, it's healthy air. He wades ashore. This time, he brings his sampler with him and a weapon, and he has dark goggles to protect his eyes from sunlight. He found Earth really too bright, and uh, he, he 
Dow didn't have his helmet on, and he didn't have his wetsuit on, so he needed to wear these goggles. Lalo explored the marsh, and he, his tester indicated that gold was there. He also found fish aplenty, uh, but the water registered undrinkable. So he climbed a hill and found an edible food, edible food, and a pound, a pod of drinkable water. So he found water and fruit, and he shot a snake, which he wasn't aware of those before. These creatures were not on Nibiru. And then the abrupt fall of darkness on Earth startled him. Nibiru's days stretch much longer. Yeah, I, I will say that the uh, the snake, in all probability, was an indication that there had been reptilians on uh, the planet before um, the Anunnaki arrived. And we have a lot of information that shows that's the case, actually, uh, and uh, because they that's the uh, the Draco's uh, critter, the snake. So in the Gulf, Alalu was able to say, yeah, there's gold here. And then he not only ascertained that there was gold, but he took the missiles out of his ship and he aimed them at Nibiru. And this is a quote from Enki. The speaker of words Alalu stirred up toward Nibiru, the words to carry. On another world I am. The gold of salvation I have found. The fate of Nibiru is now in my hands. To my conditions, you must give heed. Return my throne. On Nibiru, the council heard Alalu's demands. Quote, two royal princes, the commanders of the weapons, protected the palace with two divine weapons, the royal hunter and the royal smiter. The gateway to the palace was flanked by eagle men, who are uniformed astronauts, with the winged disc emblem of the Biru centrally displayed. The council heard Alalu's transmission in the throne room, where Anu sat on his throne, flanked by his foremost son, Enlil, seated on the right, and his firstborn son, Enki, seated on his left. Anyone present could speak, but Anu's word was final. Enlil impugged Alalu's data. He and the council begged Anu, resist Alalu. Yeah, he impugned these. Don't don't trust uh, my my brother. He's he's exaggerating. We don't really know that there's that much gold there. So, uh, Anu had Enlil beam uh, back to Earth, uh, beam a message to Alalu. Anu, the king, to you his greeting sends of your well-being to learn. He is pleased. And then Enlil added, "Prove there's ample gold on Earth." Enki said to the council. Look, I'll, ro I'll rock it to Earth, and I'll see if there's enough gold to uh, make it worth sending miners. From gold dust of Earth, a shield for Nibiru, its atmosphere to save, he said. Let Alalu Earth rule as king. For kingship on Nibiru, let him wrestle Dad, let him wrestle Anu. But let me in a chariot, a rocket to Earth journey, a path through the asteroids with water, not fire, I shall fashion. On Earth, from the waters... Let me the precious gold obtain. To Nibiru, back it will be sent. So Anu sent his son Enki to Earth. His job, mollify Alalu. Well, Enki, since he had married Alalu's daughter, you know, he was Alalu's uh, daughter and uh, son-in-law, so he could mediate between Alalu and Anu. 443,000 years ago, Enki and 50 Nibiru men splashed into the Persian Gulf, and Alalu guided them ashore. When they landed, they heard a speaker. It was Alalu welcoming them. He beamed directions of his whereabouts, so they floated the chariot like a boat towards him. Then they made their way inland. The oceans narrowed. Land appeared on both sides. Enki and his men put on their fishes suit. And they opened a hatch, descended into the marshes, and attached strong ropes to the chariot so they could pull it to land. Anki and his men feeded Alalu. They set up camp, and they found lots of gold in the southeast of Africa. At Basra, Anki and Enlil were having arguments about authority. So Enlil uh, messages his dad, Father Anu, please, affirm succession that I... By your half-sister, Antu, 
rank. I'm higher than Enki, although he's your oldest. Please come, Dad. Come to Earth and deal with Alalu, too. He's still claiming that he rules here and Nibiru also. Well, 416,000 years ago, Anu did just that. He rocketed to Earth. His mission was to create a chain of command and deal with Alalu's threats. On Earth, Anu put three straws in one hand, held them out to Enki and Enlil. Which of you, my sons, draws the, the long straw will rule Nibiru? See, I'm even putting that up for grabs. Draw the short straw, and you get to command Earth. Draw the middle-sized straw, straw, and you run mining and sea transport, which is what's going to save Nibiru. Why, there are lots of tasks they divided. Anu won, and he got to return to Nibiru to rule, and he remained on the throne. The Eden to Enlil was allotted to be Lord of Command. More settlements to establish of the skyships and their heroes charged to take. Of all the lands, until they bar of the seas encounter the leader to be Enlil, Lord of Command, extended King Anu's military dictatorship to Earth. Enlil, who preceded Enki as Anu's successor on Nibiru, now ruled Enki on Earth too. To Enki, the seas and the oceans, oceans as his domain, were granted lands beyond the bar of the waters by him to be governed in the Absu, which is Africa, to be the master with ingenuity, ingenuity the goal to procure. When Anu and his sons divided rule of Nibiru and Earth, forward toward Anu, Alalu stepped and he shouted, Mastery of Earth to me was allotted. That was the promise when when the gold finds to Nibiru, I announced, that was the deal. Now I have to claim Nibiru's throne. You can't throw that claim away. That's the deal. Well, Anu again wrestled Alalu. And they had a big fight. Finally, Anu, quote, on the chest of Alalu with his foot pressed down. Victory in the wrestling, thereby celebrating. I, said Anu, am king. Alalu stepped forward, blocking Anu's exit path. A grave matter has been forgotten, he shouted. His eyes red with rage, he roared. The mastery of earth to me was allotted this promise when I announced the finding of gold to Nibiru. And I must remind you that I've not forsaken my claim to Nibiru's throne. It is a grave abomination that Anu shares with all his sons. Anu, speechless at first, responded with anger at Alalu's challenge on their decisions and demanded that our dispute be decided by a second wrestling and let it be here now. Alalu scowled with disdain, removed his clothes. Anu dropped his robe to the floor. Everyone stepped back while two younger council members rushed in to clear a space in the center of the crowd that gathered around Anu and Alalu as they paced and postured, snarled and growled looking for a weakness. That first opening, they needed to find an opening to launch an attack. The two naked royals grappled, muscles bulging, sweat pouring. A mighty struggle it was. Pretty evenly matched, Anu was a bit quicker and stronger. Alalu's knee buckled from the strain and fell with a loud smack to the floor. Then Anu stood with his foot on Alalu's chest, pressing down, making it hard for Alalu to breathe, making a point while he declared his victory. He had a big smile on his face. By wrestling, this decision is now made. I am king of Nibiru. Alalu shall never return. So he's boasting. He finishes his statement. He takes his foot off the fallen Alalu. When he does that, Alalu bolts straight upright. He grabs uh, Anu by the legs, pulls him down, and chomps off Anu's male hood. Not only chomps it off, but he swallows it. Anu roars in agony. He cries out to the heavens. His shout fades to a whimper, and he falls to the ground, holding his gushing wound. Enki rushes to his father, and uh, Enlil grabs the laughing Alalu so he doesn't escape. Uh, the other... Uh, People, the heroes, they call them, uh, rush to the aid of, the, of uh, Enki and Enlil and, and uh, the king. One of the group carried Anu to his hut while the angry, angry cursing words toward Alalu was spewing from Anu's mouth. He was really beside himself. 
Edna shouted to his adjunct, Let justice be done, King Alalu, with your beam no, kill. Go kill Alalu with your beam weapon. No, no, Enki moved between Alalu and the weapon, aimed at his chest. Justice now lies within him, in his innards. A life threatening poison has entered. And though shook his head in agreement, the adjunct lowered his weapons as heroes took Alalu to a reed hut on the far side of the complex. Hands and feet bound as a prisoner, he was now to await judgment. Enki stayed with Alalu in his reed hut while Anu... No, he stayed Anu, with Anu. I'm sorry. I'll read that again. Enki stayed with Anu in his reed hut while Anu moaned in pain, barely conscious. Enki gave Anu potions to put him to sleep and watch the king stabilize. Meanwhile, in another hut, Alalu sat spitting. <laughs> the malehood of Anu and his innards made him ill. His inwards protruded, impregnated by Anu's semen like a female in travail, his belly greatly swollen. By the third dawn, Anu's pain finally subsided. By that point, his pride was hurting more than his physical pain. Dark circles and voice gravely, he gathered his sons to his side. He said, I wish to return to Nibiru. Anu and Rutu Nibiru left Alalu with food and tools on Mars. He also left on Mars uh, Alalu's kinsman Anzu, who had uh, been the pilot of uh, Enki's uh, craft uh, going uh, to Earth. So Anzu's job was to take care of ex-king Alalu as he died uh, on, from the poison he had ingested. He was going to die there on uh, Mars. And the king uh, by and by sent his daughter Nima with female medical officers to Earth. On Mars, stop, he said. If Anzu lives, give a man to start a base there. On Mars, Anzu found Alalu and Anzu. Both uh, seemed to be dead, but she was able to revive Anzu. To honor Alalu, who had found the gold that could save Nibiru, the image of Alalu, this is a quote, the image of Alalu upon the great rock mountain Sindonia with beams, N Nima's crew, and Anzu carved the face of Alalu. They showed Alalu wearing an eagle's helmet, his face they made uncovered, facing the earth. Alalu's legacies, of course, include that monument, Sindonia. Another legacy of Alalu is the dynastic rivalry that has gone on to this day between Marduk, who is Alalu's legitimate successor, and Nanar, who is the son that Anu wound up choosing to uh, succeed him uh, as Nibiru king. And the next other legacy of Alalu were the nuclear missiles that he brought to Earth, because these were the missiles that will kill Sodom, Gomorrah, Zoar, Sinai, and yes, Sumer too. And that's it for today. Thank you for joining us on Aquarian Radio at AquarianRadio.com. Our books on ancient ETs and the Anunnaki are Anunnaki Gods No More, Anunnaki Legacy of the Gods, Anunnaki False Gods, and Marduk, King of Earth, which has just been released April of 2017. Our website, websites are AquarianRadio.com, EnkiSpeaks.com, E-N-K-I-S-P-E-A-K-S.com, ExtraterrestrialContact.com, and we will be at the Mars Moon Conference in Mobile, Alabama, the first weekend of May 2017, and in May 19th to the 21st, 2017, we will be at Contact in the Desert. We hope to see you there. Thank you very much, and love and blessings, and aloha for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for joining us today, today on Aquarian Radio. We broadcast daily, and our schedule is on AquarianRadio.com. Listen live by calling 646-649-0893, or you can listen live by calling 646-649-0893, or listen to our archives on AquarianRadio.com. Join us again soon, and do tell your friends. The age of Aquarius and the paradigm of peace is now. <laughs>